Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, Tom here. Welcome back to The Royal Ramble, our ridiculously in-depth celebration of one of the greatest TV comedies ever, The Royal Family. Now, it's been a little while since the last episode, I hope you're well, and today we are starting a new series, Series 2, which is very exciting, but before we get into the analysis and the emails, I've got a few announcements of my own. So, one of the reasons it's been a bit of a longer wait is that I've actually been recording and editing two Raw Ramble episodes, not only the one you're listening to right now, but also Season 2, Episode 2, Sunday Afternoon, you know, the one where Twiggy descends on the Raw Roast Dinner, and that is now actually complete and ready for you to listen to over on our brand new Patreon account. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a service used by lots and lots of podcasters and creators, where basically you can financially support the show if you wish, and in return you get premium access to the product, to the Raw Ramble. Obviously the show isn't going behind a paywall or anything like that and the episodes will be coming out as normal but from now on whenever I drop a new episode of the podcast the next episode of the show will then be available on the Patreon so you can listen to Sunday Afternoon now on the Patreon if you like and when that comes out on the main feed in a month or so Nana's Coming to Stay will be available on the Patreon etc etc so yeah if you just want to enjoy the show and wish to give back you can listen right now to the next episode and if you do sign up you can download it straight to your phone like standard or listen online via your subscription. Now, this is not a cold-hearted money grab or anything like that. The Raw Ramble is a labour of love and one that I'm fully dedicated to, but yeah, you know, podcasts aren't free to maintain, so every little helps. And if you just can't wait, you know, if you just have to listen to the next Raw Ramble episode, then consider helping the show out. I'll put the link for the Patreon down below and there'll be more information on the page itself. And also going on the Patreon first for supporters before they drop on the main channel will be some new Raw Ramble offshoot series. As doing the main episodes takes a hell of a lot of time, from watching and researching to writing the notes, editing and mastering, etc. So I wanted to do something a bit more freeform within the sphere of this wonderful universe. So there are now two new series coming. The first of which is going to be a quiz show. I'm still hammering out the details personally, but basically what I want to do is have some of you listeners on for perhaps 10 questions all about the show, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about your Royal Family history, fave episodes, moments too, stuff like that. The first editions of these will be all about series one, and then we'll go from there. So if you're interested, and I know a few of you are because I popped this idea out on the Twitter recently and got some attention, please email me, theroyalramblepod at gmail.com, and I'll get back to you and we'll sort something out and we'll record something. And yeah, it'll probably take about 20 minutes all in all, and these two will be on the Patreon first and then released properly afterwards. I am going to be a bit of a bastard with these questions though. Like, as you know, I'm a bit of a stickler for detail. So yeah, you better really know your shit about the Royal Family because uh, we're going to go granular. And the second series that I want to do as well, intermittently, is going to be the Raw Ramble Book Club. So I've been on a bit of a spending spree of late, picking up all the autobiographies and biographies I can get from the main cast. And basically these episodes will be me reviewing the books and discussing the fascinating personal histories of the actors behind this masterpiece of a show. And the first episode, which I've already started working on, is on Liz Smith's terrific autobiography, Our Betty, which was a real surprise to me. I mean, you know, what a mind she is, what a character. It's a bit of an odd book, and I don't mean that in a negative way, where it's it's very different to typical autobiographies in the sense where it's kind of 150 mini chapters that are all like two or three pages long and she's very surreal Liz Smith and absurd and has a beautiful poetic mind and all the stuff about her childhood and you know losing her mother young and being in the war and then being an actress later on in life it's just riveting I will say there is two pages on the royal family there is just two um she says it was the greatest experience of her career she clearly values it as like the jewel in her crown which is fantastic would have liked a bit more liz but i can't really complain because the whole book is completely fascinating so yeah again that's another show that if you support on patreon you'll be getting an exclusive first listen to but just to let you know what I'm planning in the future, so along with the episodes coming up. So we got the book club and the quiz show as well. And of course, you know, I don't expect you to support us on the Patreon, and any who do, I'm very grateful for. And there are plenty of other ways that you can support the show otherwise. You can leave us a five-star review on iTunes, which really helps with the algorithm. Go check out all the reviews so far. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, where I'm also uploading the episodes. You can tell a friend, perhaps, about the show, a fellow Raw fanatic. Or you can follow us at Raw Ramble Pod, or indeed email me at therawrambledpod at gmail.com. And I'm very happy to say that today we have three fantastic emails, which I'll just go through now before we go deep on the opening episode of Series 2, Pregnancy. And our first email comes from Liam. Liam says, Hi, 
I am absolutely loving your content. It is a pleasure to listen to such a detailed analysis of one of the best sitcoms. I love how I can picture each scene, even each camera shot, based on your addition of clips and detail of action. At the time of writing, you are about to release a Series 2 review, which in my opinion is the strongest collection of episodes. While there may be more iconic episodes elsewhere, Series 2 is simply faultless in my view. Not that there are many faults at all within the original series. I first got into the Royal Family at a young age, as my older brother received the Best Of DVD for a birthday present. The list of episodes were The Wedding, the Christmas special, the first one, Anthony's 18th, Decorating, Christening, and the Christmas special too. I was wondering if there's any episode from this list you would change if you had to select a best of top six. Additionally, I cannot wait for your early doors ramble. The show is perfect and is highly underappreciated. Thanks, Liam. And yeah, thank you, Liam. And it's hard, really. I mean, those are a great best of six, aren't they? Like, if I'm talking best of in terms of, like, just personal writing performance, you know, you guys know that I love Another Woman. Um, I love Barbara's Had Enough. I really, really enjoy the Sunday dinner episode as well. I think that's fantastic, and I've had such a blast doing that one. Um, so I think that's a good kind of sextet, really, isn't it? If you kind of just want to get into the show. I mean, I understand why they're all there. The christening is just marvellous. Decorating as well, probably the most kind of memeable, uh, if we can use that word in the Royal Family, like probably the most memorable kind of viral scene of them dancing or whatever. A lot of people associate that with the show. So, um, yeah, those all make sense for me, Liam. And the early doors ramble as well. I know a lot of you guys are excited about that. I mean, the way the Raw Ramble is going now, it's probably going to be an episode a month, because I've just got so many other commitments, even though I do love doing the show, so probably not going to get to early doors for a few years, <laughs> so, you know, like, like, like Raw Family, like early doors, these things take time, you know, you've got to be patient. Okay, and our second email comes from Jack, and he says, hey Tom, love these podcasts, I'm a deep appreciator of the show, but also someone interested in any media being dissected in detail, your delivery is great and engaging, thank you Jack, something I've noted for my own projects. Now, Jack in this email reveals a show he's working on kind of a little bit in the vein of Raw Ramble, and I don't want to announce what it is, because in case anyone steals it, although it's so niche, I don't think anyone would, but Jack knows I'm really excited for this show, and Jack continues, I just wondered about your research process before each episode, what it consists of, and how you ensure you feel satisfied with the content you discuss. Your episodes are always very detailed, and I can't imagine you miss much out. Also, a rogue shout, but have you ever watched Our Friends in the North? I can imagine that would be something you'd analyse or just enjoy. All the best, Jack. Now, I will get to Our Friends in the North because, uh, well, let's get to it now. I watched it after Jack suggested it. I was aware of it. I know that it's kind of the go-to landmark British drama. And I will say now that it is the greatest British dramatic TV show I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, you know, I, there's not too many that I could really point to that are, like, in my Hall of Fame. Like, maybe the This Is England shows... You know, Happy Valley I really like as well. I'm not really a Line of Duty fan. I really like the first series of Lenny James' Save Me. I thought the second series was abysmal and kind of let it all down. But um, Our Friends of the North, for people who aren't aware, it basically follows a group of four friends. And it's nine episodes, and each episode jumps forward about three or four years in time. So it kind of charts the social history of Britain against these characters. And all the actors, like I mentioned Line of Duty before, Gina McKee, and she's in it, Christopher Eccleston, Daniel Craig, and Mark Strong. So it's kind of, you know, unbelievable casting. So, Jack, thank you for the recommendation there and in terms of my research process you know to be honest with you it's very loose I begin by watching the episode once through pausing every 20 seconds or so to capture any thoughts by bullet point and note down what quotes I want to include where and you know whenever anything cultural comes up that needs a bit more research say like Pomaine or Scylla Black you know I tend to just highlight that and return to it later when I've consulted sources after this, I tend to just do the same thing again. I watch it again to help cement my thoughts, this time pausing less and shoring up my notes to make sure that everything reads properly and I've not missed out any lines of dialogue or allusions in the script. And I also have the printed script to hand here as well to see if anything's missed out or said differently. From there on, I just kind of record and riff, you know, on what I've got, adding in the clips later of anything else that I realise I might have wished to have said or missed out. You know, and in terms of feeling satisfied with what I've got, I mean, that's more of a personal preference. You know, I don't really labour over every word and I feel like doing that can be a little counterproductive I mean my best advice to anyone really and I'm like who am I to give advice I'm the amateur podcaster but if you enjoy the show my advice would be just to kind of feel the flow and try to find your own voice when you're doing a pilot and then just push forward with what you feel comfortable and normally that translates best for an audience I found so yeah, thank you, Jack. Okay, and our final message comes from Andres. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, sir, so apologise for that. He says, Hi, Tom. Just a message from Belgium to say that I'm really enjoying the podcast, which I stumbled across this week and quickly binged through all in a few days. It's great hourly accompaniment while doing long stretches of data processing for my job or making dinner doing dishes. Plus, it's company, you know, when you live on your own, to quote Norma Speakman. 
Most podcasts I follow have multiple people bouncing off each other. I never would have thought that one single man talking in a brummy accent for an hour straight could captivate me so. Much respect for your in-depth research and insights. Though I've seen it all multiple times over, I've never stopped to pay attention to a lot of the stuff. For example, the extra layers of judgement that come with the phrase a dusky peach, which is only testament to the enormous loving care that Carolyn Ahern, Craig Cash and Associates put into their writing. And it's a pity that the show is almost unknown over here. To my knowledge, it's never been on Belgian telly, though lots of the pop culture references will get lost anyway. I caught bits of it on the BBC while channel hopping as a teenager, then got the box set a few years later, which must be among my most watched DVDs ever, next to Ab Fab, Arrested Development, The Office Extras, and anything involving Alan Partridge. Some good choices there. And now, in my late 30s, I'm still savouring the depth, warmth, and accuracy in this show. I agree that the later specials were pretty much a different show from the three seasons. Much like in Ab Fab, all the characters, Denise and Dave in particular, became two-dimensional cartoon cutout versions of their previous selves. That said, I was still gladly watched The Queen of Sheba and The New Sofa back-to-back every Christmas. Barbara doing Nana's hair with the two of them ending up singing K Sarah Sarah and the hospital montage, especially Look After a God are such gut punches every single time that it overshadows how outlandish and facile a lot of the post-2000 material is. Anyway, looking forward to your ramblings on the rest of the show. Take care and best of luck with this gigantic work. P.S. You're not the only one who feels seen by the short cheeky shot of Dave quickly rearranging his genitals in his boxers, something I, and I imagine most males, do more than I care to admit. Yet another example of the Rule family being more true to life than any other TV show would dare. Now, thank you for that email, and f- great emails, all of those were terrific emails. Like, you know, I'm really floored by the depth of correspondence that this show is seeming to generate. So, again, cheers for the emails, and if you do want to get in touch with the show, the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com, you know, send your emails in there, send your thoughts on the show, if you want to come on the quiz show as well, all that sort of stuff. But anyway, enough rambling about things that aren't the Raw family, let's get into the episode. Okay, and let's start with the title, Pregnancy. I mean, the absoluteness of that title really doesn't bury the lead, does it? And it's worth considering some of the other episode titles of this series because they do sort of tell a mini story you know so we have pregnancy sunday lunch is next then we have like a little triptych in my eyes we have nana's coming to stay nana comes to stay barbara's finally had enough and Barbara's finally had enough for many, many reasons, but, you know, a lot of that kind of fermented through Nana's staying. And just another point on Nana coming to stay as well, because I've kind of, I'm watching, I'm always watching a few episodes ahead, just to sort of appreciate the totality of the show, of the series, etc. And it is worth noting, I mean, I'll get into this when I discuss these episodes in the coming months, but Nana is in the title of two episodes. She's not in Nana's coming to stay at all. And in Nana comes to stay, she's asleep for pretty much the entire episode until the last five minutes so yeah just another subtle touch from the uh, royal scribes there you know and it's worth considering as well so this episode dropped in september 99 23rd of september 99 to be exact i was seven years old and you know it's worth considering that this show was a huge hit at this point you know it had gotten a lot of recognition a lot of viewers at the time i think it had moved from bbc2 to bbc1 perhaps that was from series 2 to 3 i have to double check that but i know certainly it did move channels and you know i'm always interested in the past as you guys have learned from this show no doubt so were you there at the time when this show was kind of when there was royal mania as it were and they had like the you know the board games and the gym royal all the tat and all that sort of stuff um let me know the royal ramble at gmail.com and it's also worth thinking about as well that we have a new writer on the show so in the first series it was caroline and craig with henry normal and in this series is carmel morgan and it's interesting to note that uh, she's not around for the third series that's just both of the guys writing together that being caroline and but Carmel Morgan is on for seven episodes. I mean, I, guys, I'm trying to get these people on the show as well. I've reached out to Henry Normal. Uh, Carmel Morgan, I'll reach out as well. Like, you know, my dream really is to interview the entire cast. Maybe Sue Johnston would be like the, the, the cherry on top, really. Or Craig Cash. They're like the two that I really, really admire. But, but all of them, Ricky Thompson, you're kidding me, Ralph Little, Andrew Wyman, like, you know, any of them to have a chance to speak to them would be Jessica Stevenson, like any of these people it would be a joy. But um, just before we get into the episode, let's just have a little bit on Carmel Morgan. So I found this from a website called Coronation Street Blog, which terms itself as an independent fan site written by and for the fans since 2007. Carmel Morgan grew up in a spam-coloured council bungalow near Oxford. She graduated in Liverpool in 1987 
1947 and spent 10 years working as a press officer, but longed to become a writer. After many years of idle optimism, she finally began writing full-time in 1999, serving an apprenticeship on the second series of The Royal Family. In July 99, Carmel landed her dream job when her trial script for the groundbreaking Channel 4 soap Brookside was given the thumbs up. She then went on to write over 40 episodes of Brookie before joining Coronation Street in 2002. Still a regular Coronation Street writer, and she is still at the time. She took time out to pen an episode of Paul Abbott's Shameless. Uh, Paul Abbott, of course, is a Royal Family fan that we've mentioned before. And more recently, to write a stage play for Dawn French and Alison Moyet. The play, Smaller, toured for six weeks at the beginning of 2006 before an extended run in the West End. Carmel is also, interestingly, a member of the Philip Larkin Society, and she actually included one of the poems in an episode of Coronation Street. Um, Philip Larkin is one of my favourite writers, and, you know, I do see a lot of parallels with him and the royal family. Like, I think he would look down his nose at the royal family, no doubt about that. But, you know, they both kind of revel in the beauty of the mundane. And I was trying to do a bit more research on, like, Karma Morgan and Royal Family, because there isn't really much out there. You know, there's no, like, so many classic British sitcoms have, like, big paperback books that you can get off Amazon, you know, the grand history, the oral history and stuff like that. So trying to put the pieces together here, but I did find this from The Sun. Yes, I'm sorry, it had to be The Sun. And this is just after Carolyn Ahern passed away. So this is Carmel. Carmel, who has several writing credits on the Royal Family, also hailed Caroline as a pioneer, describing her battle to get the boundary-pushing comedy on the air, paving the way for shows like The Office to be made. She said it was difficult to pick a favourite memory of Caroline as she had so many, but did relate one anecdote from the filming of The Royal Family. She said, Caroline was just lying on the floor trying to think of dialogue, and she just came out of a line that Norma would say about a doctor to one of Anthony's friends. Do you know what he said to me? Even though I'm taking the cataract out of your eye, I'm leaving the twinkle in. And to me, that just sums up her talent. So yeah, of course, we're going to get to that. And that is, of course, from episode four, Nana Comes to Stay. So let's get into the episode. We fade in from the TV being turned on, as it always is on the opening credits, to a shot that's now showing us what's on top of the TV. It's a framed wedding photo of Dave and Denise together, something I guess they must have taken at the time when they were recording the final episode of series one, when they were all in costume and stuff like that. And it's a lovely snap. Dave beaming, with Denise a little more reserved at his side, but still happy. She's got a little drawstring bag around her arm. And this image is pride of place on top of the telly, amongst a stack of fairly cheap-looking sporting trophies, no doubt Anthony's yield. And we can also see a lottery ticket between the frame of the photo and a small knick-knack golden pot of sorts. As we open as well, of course, the TV is on straight away, and it's Judith Chalmers with Wish You Were Here. So Judith Chalmers, also Judith Rosemary Locke Chalmers, OBE. She was born on the 10th of October 1935. A British television presenter who is best known for presenting the travel programme Wish You Were Here, which aired from 74 to 2003. She's married to sports commentator Neil Durden-Smith since 64. And her son Mark Durden-Smith, you may be aware of him. I, wasn't, I didn't realise that was her son. That was Judith Chalmers' son. But, you know, nepotism reigns supreme in TV. And Wish You Were Here. I remember Wish You Were Here watching it as a kid, actually. I remember it being on at, like, seven. It was on before the soap started I remember if I'd have like a bath as a kid or something I'd normally watch that because soaps being on at seven Emmerdale being on at seven that was a more recent thing I seem to imagine but it probably still happened about 20 years ago but Wish You Were Here British TV show that first broadcast on the 7th of January 1974 on ITV it was a series of 30 minute shows about travel and holidays and it was broadcast during peak viewing hours it was cancelled though in 2003 after a reshuffling of the primetime Monday 7pm slot and as you know by now the Royal Family absolutely loves irony and jerks position and here we have the swanky slinky background music of wish you were here where judith chalmers is explaining where bermuda is we have that playing as the camera pans from the tv and across the room reorientating us in the household which is half the world away from bermuda in northern manchester the irony here of course being that this quirky music is highlighting the drudgery and normalness of the home and as it builds, we crescendo into Jim, slovenly sat on his throne, with Barbara spread out beside him. But before we get to them, you know, there's lots of details to explore as the camera is moving across. So as you know from my time scouring the bureau in this room and Barbara's dressing table upstairs, I can't get enough of this bric-a-brac. So we see a blurry photo amongst the rabble. I, I think in the feathers. It's of Jim and Barbara. Maybe Denise is there. It's kind of hard to work out. Um, beside that, there's a porcelain circus doll, which is all blue and white. There's also a clock with another unframed photo of Dave and Denise in front. Perhaps that's one of the ones that Nana took from her 36 film camera that Twiggy fitted. In this one, Dave is again smiling and Denise is again a little muted, you know, just kind of looking ahead. 
And there's also another framed photo soon after that, which is a big close-up of Jim and Barbara, with Jim's head looking particularly large as it fills the frame. Behind that, up against the wall, is an open exotic fan, along with lots of postcards stuck up too. You know, it's tough ultimately to make out what a lot of this stuff is, and that's due to the grainy kitchen sink camera print of the show. Something that I think really works in its favour, especially for a show that's all about suggestions of things rather than explicitly showing them. You know, and I'd say that's one of the reasons why, like I've mentioned before, that I don't really like the new specials. And I'd say one of the reasons is because it's in HD, you know, and I'm not blaming them. I know they're going to move for the times, but kind of, you know, the spirit of those things. Let's put Queen of Sheba aside because that is unbelievable. But, you know, paradoxically, the more we can see, the less real it feels, at least to me. You know, I I just love the sort of 16 millimeter, somewhat grubby aesthetic that the show's going for at this time. So we pan across and we get our first glimpse of the rules themselves. And surprise, surprise, not much has changed. Jim with his flies undone, sticking up from his crotch, still rocking the same yellow and yellowed shirt that we always see him in. And Barbara smiling as she watches the telly, playing with her hair absently. On the table, we can see an overflowing ashtray, some mugs, and a copy of the Mirror newspaper with a partially viewable headline that just reads BANNED in capital letters. Now, I did try and look on the British Library website to see exactly what the headline is. I mean, I got the extra mile for you guys, right? And I was looking for the 98 and 97 editions, and nothing sadly. It didn't seem to be anything with BANNED on it, so maybe it was a prop paper, maybe it was a different edition or something like that. I'm not sure. I d- but the show is so based in reality, I'm sure it would have been a real paper, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. I did see, interestingly, and God, isn't it so interesting to look at old newspapers, but especially this is a time I remember, like one of my earliest memories is Beckham fouling Simeone when I was like in year two or something, the, the Argentina game at the World Cup. And it's really funny to see the headline the following day where it just says, basically cheer up and get over it just in big letters like you know there wasn't the wallowing or clearly there wasn't the domestic destruction that the recent game versus Italy wrought and as we move then in the opening shot from the TV with Dave and Denise the photo on top we get our first dialogue of the series and both Barbara and Jim are succinctly summed up here Bermuda shorts what's the history of them no, the British Army was too hot here. Don't they look lovely off. there? Very practical. What, what legs do you have? Just, just above the knee. What about the colours this season? Barbara, seeing the good in things, stating that the exotic location is lovely, and Jim dismissing it, of course, putting in a my ass there for good measure, which at this point must have been the catchphrase of the country. And it's interesting, Bermuda my ass as well. I mean, both places where, where man fears to tread. Barbara declares that Judith Chalmers is looking her age, but in time-honoured Barbara tradition, she doesn't actually know her age. And there's a great shot change here too that takes us behind Jim's ear, putting Jim out of focus, as Barbara watches on. And from this angle, we can see that she has a little pink wristwatch. Despite her age, whatever it is, Judith Chalmers, it doesn't matter though, as she has some lovely wraparound skirts that Barbara tells us about. It's kind of a bit like Jackie Kennedy, isn't it, in a few episodes back on Jim's birthday, where... Barbara was talking about her, but the revelation was not about, you know, what they did to Jack. It was more that she had lovely clothes. So new series or not, Barbara's still Barbara. Jim is still Jim. We see him pick his nose deep and rub it out on his shirt. And Barbara, she then gets on to the important questions. Oh, thank you. This must be one of the most spectacular views ever on the golf course, isn't it? Who do you think is the oldest air or Gloria Honeyford, Jim? Uh, it's one of Robert Tenjurn's... Jim, who do you think's the eldest, Earl or Gloria Honeyford? Yes, 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 I couldn't give a shiny <laughs> shite. <laughs> yeah, Bob. Jim instantly shutting her down there. I mean, humorously, no doubt, shiny shite is great, but still a bit heartlessly too. Barbara retreats into herself after this and lays in repose, really, for a few moments. Gloria Honeyford as well. Who's Gloria Honeyford? Well, she is Mary Winifred Gloria Honeyford, OBE as well as Chalmers. She's a Northern Irish TV and radio presenter, known for her programmes on the BBC and ITV, such as Rip Off Britain, her regular appearances as a panellist on Loose Women. She's also been a regular reporter on This Morning and The One Show. And if you do give a shiny shite, by the way, I did the research. Judith Chalmers is actually five years older than Gloria Honeyford. How interesting. It's been revealed at this point as well that there is a third royal in the room, Anthony, who we haven't actually seen as cleverly the camera pans straight from beside him across the room to his parents and not doing the full 360. And taking heed from Judith and talks about holidays, Anthony, who, by the way, looks way older than he did in the first series, you know, his 18th birthday is not too far away, he reveals that someone he knows is quite the globetrotter. And you know Darren's cousin, Steve? Yeah. He's been abroad twice this year. Ooh. Oh, and where did he go to, lad? Uh, he went to Magaluf in February, and 
Lorette de Mar in July. Mm-hmm. He's hardly Alan Bloody Wicked, is he? Nah, them phenomenologies are the Swiss. All right, let's break down these locations first. Magaluf, major holiday resort, of course, on the Spanish island of Mallorca, primarily catering to British, Russian, Irish, German and Scandinavians in the package holiday market. British tour operators have apparently regularly warned the Spanish tourist board that the image of Magaluf is affecting their efforts to market Mallorca. It is commonly called Shagaluf, of course, in popular British culture. And Lorette de Mar. Lorette de Mar is a Mediterranean coastal town in Catalonia, Spain, and it is around 50 miles northeast of Barcelona. It attracts some of it, like Magaluf, it attracts summer visitors on package tours, and its main beach is one of the most popular Costa Brava beaches, and is consistently awarded the blue flag for cleanliness. So Darren's cousin Steve, like, there's another name that I don't think ever gets brought up, but it's just kind of cool that both Jim and Barbara obviously know who he is. This is kind of introducing the idea of Darren as well, who I believe we will meet at the end of this series. So that's with Anthony's birthday. Yeah, I think that's right. We only see him on Anthony's birthday. And then he becomes a little bit more regular as we go into series three. So Jim asked the question, so he seemed genuinely curious, but then he just stomps all over it, saying he's hardly Alan Wicker. And and Alan Wicker, who the hell's Alan Wicker? We've got a lot of references here early on, dear listeners. Alan Donald Wicker, born 1921, died 2013, was a British journalist and TV presenter and broadcaster. His career spanned almost 60 years, during which time he presented the documentary television series Wicker's World for over 30 years. And he was made a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2005 for his series to broadcasting. Wicker reported stories of social interests from around the world. His interviews included locals, politicians, celebrities, and even convicted criminals, as he reported on stories as far-ranging as military dictatorships, British expatriates, the feminist movement of the 70s, the tanker people of Hong Kong, and even the building of Disney World in Florida. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to have to explore Wick as well. That sounds really interesting. So as we say, Jim was inquisitive, maybe in a faux way, just to get Anthony to say something so we can attack him. And Jim just then doubles down on his attack. Them bloody travel agents are up and every bugger off and mugs like him fall for it. What be falling for, Jim? Well, there's nothing you can do abroad that you can't do here. It just costs you twice as bloody much. They're on their holidays. They're having a good time. Having a good time, my ass. You spend half the time on the cars. You don't. You have no wild shites. You may as well do that here in the comforts of your own home. <laughs> you are a miserable sod, Jim. You are. It's interesting to see Anthony roll his eyes and return back to the TV when Jim begins the tirade. Anthony, as we know in later episodes really goes up in the world and no doubt travels widely and even at a young age can just see that Jim's being just a little bit of an isolationist, a little bit of a little man here, you know, for want of a better word. And Jim, of course, this is his tact. I mean, Jim, who we'll see later in the series, talk about the fact that then doctors are raking it in, you know. Anything above him in renown or interest is brought right back down to earth with his stinging dismissals. He does get them both laughing, however, with his wild shites comment. And that got me wondering, actually, see what you think about this. Has Jim ever been abroad? I mean, we know that Dave and Denise obviously have on their honeymoon, at least. But I struggle, you know, to imagine him wanting to go or to be willing to pay the money. I mean, can you imagine him taking Barbara away on a trip to Italy, for example, or even Anthony going along with them? (laughs) Not me. But in terms of wild shites, to be fair to Jim, I guess he's speaking from experience, as the last time we saw him in the show was in this living room, and he was speaking of having wild shites on the wedding day. When Barbara calls Jim miserable, calls him out for his statement, Jim stares in disbelief. And, you know, again, I'd imagine he's playing along somewhat. He he knows he's in this kind of miserly archetype. And there's also a nice wide shot after this as well, so it kind of retreats back behind Jim, and it allows us to appreciate the wedding photo and all of its glory on top of the box. And what we see here, too as in the middle of the living room the kind of you know the nucleus of it that is pretty much all we see in this episode i mean you know the royal family is a claustrophobic show at the best of times but let's think of the wedding episode for example you know went upstairs downstairs corridors kitchens etc looking out the windows but this episode like i have to actually do some like number crunching and some data analysis but i think in terms of locales this is like the tightest it ever gets it's only at the very end of the episode when jim walks up the stairs keon and my ass that we leave like the kitchen for example is viewed from the sitting like I think anthony goes over to the bacon etc so i don't know if this is the most sedimentary episode ever the most recalcitrant but you know that is really saying something if it is you know it almost seems like the show is at pains to highlight the extremely inventive and extremely solid form that by this point it had both pioneered and mastered 
The doorbell then rings. Anthony is told to get it, of course. Jim tells a tired old joke here about the invisible man, tell him I can't see him. He's laughing deeply as he says it to himself. Barbara's eyes are rolling. I mean, that's so played out. Like, it just kind of surprised me when I watched this episode that Jim finds that so funny. Like, I know the old ones are the best, reel them in, etc. But it's like, Jim has actually said funny stuff, and when reminded of it, laugh to himself I think quite rightly so um you know remember when Barbara was talking about the expensive toilet paper and he said he might as well be wiping his ass with pound notes that was funny this invisible man thing yeah not so much and if it's the invisible man tell him I can't see him <laughs> yeah it's all right it's only David Denise Aww. Anthony opens the door declares it's only David Denise they enter together Things clearly haven't changed much in married life then. They're still coming over regularly. Again, hard to work out exactly where we are in the timeline here. Um, you know, how many months have actually passed since the wedding? It, again, not clear. And what are they wearing? You know, Denise is rocking this kind of understated purple cardigan ensemble. And Dave in a more standard jacket over a blue shirt. Denise probably got that out of the catalogue as well. Barbara, of course, asks what they've had for dinner. And though this is something she always does and, you know, will always continue to do, these queries, interestingly, take on a new dimension now as they showcase what Denise has done for her hubby, for her husband, you know, what sort of devoted wife she is. And surprise, surprise, she hasn't ascended naturally to the role. And I'm not saying that, you know, she's a wife and she has to cook a man meals or anything like that, but, you know, she hasn't. <laughs> and unfortunately, she won't really ascend very well to the natural role of a mother either, but more on that soon. Dave reveals what they had for dinner, and Jim just cannot wait to pounce. The standard of living is amongst the highest in the world. Bloody teas? Yeah. yeah. What do you have? Daily on toast. Bloody hell. I bet you were looking forward to that all day, eh, Dave? Woo! Working hard, waiting to get home to that little delicacy. Show it, Dad. Bloody hell, girl. Dairy Leon Toast. Come on, now. Hey, Delia Smith's got nothing to worry about, has she? I made it myself. Go away. Delia Smith, of course, Delia Ann Smith, born June 1941, English cook and TV presenter, known for teaching basic cookery skills in a no-nonsense style. She is one of the best-known celebrity chefs in British culture, and she is also famous for her role as joint majority shareholder at Norwich City FC. It's been claimed that Smith's TV show Delia's How to Cook led to a 10% rise in egg sales in Britain, and her use of ingredients such as frozen mash and tinned minced beef and onions, or utensils such as an omelette pan, could cause sellouts overnight. This phenomenon, dubbed the Delia Effect, was most recently seen in 2008, after her book How to Cheat at Cooking was published. And finally, in 2012, Delia Smith criticised atheism, claiming that, quote, militant neo-atheists and devout secularists are busting a gut to drive us, religious people, off the radar and try to convince us that we hardly exist. So Dave smiles as Jim digs in and then defends Denise somewhat, saying that, you know, he doesn't mind Dairy Lee, me. They're still in the honeymoon period, I suppose, but we will see him get less defensive as the show goes on. And, you know, he can't win, really, because the pregnancy is an excuse for laziness, poor food, I suppose. I mean, at least in Denise's eyes. And Dairy Lee, Dairy Lee is a popular brand of processed cheese products produced by Mondelez International and available in Ireland and the UK. As of 2017, it's also available in Australia. I always thought it was going to be an American brand, but supposedly not. And what most people might know Dairy Lee for, certainly myself, is the Lunchables. Uh, you know, in the early 21st century, they were advertised as being full of good stuff though the product contained high amounts of salt and saturated fats. Despite a 2007 reformulation that reduced salt content by 9% and saturated fat content by 34%, the claim full of good stuff was banned by the UK's Advertising Standards Authority. I mean, literally still, the triangles, all that stuff, fire. So what follows after this is about 12 seconds of silence. We can hear Judith Chalmers jabbering on in the background, actually about Magaluf, interestingly. I mean, maybe Darren's cousin Steve is in shot, who knows? The camera then focuses and refocuses from Jim on his chair to the three of them seated. Barbara looks pensive. She clearly wants to say something. She's nervous, you know, aware that what she's about to say will probably cause a ruckus, but just unable to deny her maternal instincts. Can I make you a nice bacon butty, Dave? Oh, yeah, please, Barbara. That'd be lovely. Go and put some bacon on for us, will you, Anthony? The bacon butty, the bacon sandwich. I mean, you can't really go wrong, can you? Apparently, the New York Times reported on a study conducted at Leeds University a few years ago, which consisted of testing 700 variants of the sandwich. They experimented with different cooking styles, types of bacon, breads, oils, and special editions. Each variant was then ranked by 50 tasters. In conclusion, 
The best bacon sandwiches are apparently made with crispy fried and not too fat bacon between thick slices of white bread. I mean, who would have thought, right? That totally doesn't sound like a waste of money, that survey. Barbara asks if they want the butty, but of course she tells Anthony to do it, though, who gets up grumpily. I mean, it is a bit rude. I, you know, Barbara has every right to command Anthony to do it, but he's effectively fulfilling Denise's duties here. And there's a ranking in my eyes of dog's body activities. I mean, opening the front door or fetching some ciggies from the offy is one thing, but cooking a whole snack? Like, I mean, Anthony's just chilling watching Chalmers. It's, uh, it's a little unfair, but no surprise. Denise scowls slightly at Dave when he declares that he would like some bacon. But, you know, he tries to mollify her, saying it's just a bit of bacon. Jim corrects him, saying it's a bit of my bloody bacon. But, you know, Barbara has no doubt paid for that rather than him, I would imagine, too. So again, think of Dave and Denise as well. You know, these matrimonial roles are being reversed. Denise is annoyed, still, but can't fight her own hunger, either. She bites her lip, tuts, and then breaks. Wantney, put some under for me and all. Doesn't say please even though. Like, I like how Anthony doesn't acknowledge either, but we hear the grill shifting in response. You know, it's fun also to see Barbara smiling at Jim too. I mean, she's still our Denise, you know, she seems to be saying. These are still our kids. And the camera at this point hasn't moved for a little while. You know, it's just kind of lazing languidly on Dave, Denise and Barbara, who, who are doing the same, you know, with Jim out of focus slightly. Denise then looks around and notices Jim's fly. Dad? What? Your fly owl's all undone. Ah, the cage might be open, but uh, the beast is asleep. Beast my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! Very funny from Barbara there. I mean, Jim shakes his head. Yeah, he found the Invisible Man line hilarious. I mean, you know, go figure. It reminds me a bit of what we'll see in the next episode, Sunday Dinner, when Nana gets a witty jab in at Jim's expense. And he does actually acknowledge that. Still, awesome from Barbara there, because after all, she would know. And an interesting parallel too, because later in this episode, Dave's own manhood will be mocked as well. Now, Denise, as we've just heard when she asked Anthony to put some bacon on for her, is fully capable of shouting to the kitchen. But... She's bone idle, of course. So Barbara, yet again, becomes the medium through which she asks for a special culinary request. Um, mm. Yes, go Anthony to make my bacon dead, dead crispy. Yeah. Anthony, make Denise's bacon dead, dead crispy. Dead, dead crispy. Does anyone else still use that, like, in their common parlance? I certainly do. And there's a great shot again of Anthony in response, just sullen, bitter with butter and bacon in his hands. He slams the fridge and causes a bit of clatter in the process. And Barbara looks over a little annoyed, but, you know, she's kind of caused all this, really. She could have just went in and cooked the bacon herself. I appreciate she's been at the bakery. You know, really what should have happened is Denise would have gone in there. But it's the Royals, isn't it? It's, uh, it's never going to go smooth. Barbara then reaches for a cigarette and instinctively hands Denise one who refuses. And I love this moment. What a smart way of introducing this huge step in the show, in, in the history of the family. Yeah, I'll look. Oh, no thanks. What's up with you? Nothing. Have you given up? Yeah. You've always loved smoking. Yeah, well, <laughs> me and Dave's got something to tell you. You said you weren't going to say out. Yeah, I know, well, I am now. You said it was a big secret. Yeah, but it was this morning. Mum, Dad, we're pregnant. Huh. <laughs> and you notice how Coronation Street breaks just as this soap-style news is announced. There's so much to unpack here. The way Barbara says, you've always loved smoking too. I mean, shouldn't the mother try to wean her daughter off that? You know, I appreciate it's very much in the fabric of the family though, and uh, the fabric of the settees too. We're pregnant. Not we're having a baby, or I'm pregnant. We're pregnant. There's something so innocent about that. Something only, I imagine, the parents of a firstborn would probably say. And, you know, as soon as Denise says it, there's a little silence. Dave nods to confirm. Jim gives a gasp of surprised joy. Barbara is in shock for a second. Pops a ciggy and lighter on the table. And then the future grandparents just engulf Dave and Denise in congratulations. Oh, oh, oh. Put it there, David. Well done, young man. Well done, lad. Come here, give me a dad a hug. Come here, my little girl. Well done. Well done, love. Oh, I can't believe it. <laughs>
wonderful moment that feels so real, and I can't help smiling every single time I watch it. Dave calling Jim James as he shakes his hand, Jim cuddling Denise and calling her a glowworm. But of course, there's one member of the family that is not privy to the news yet. Hey, Anthony! <laughs> Anthony! Oh, Denise and David are having a baby. Oh, nice one. Our nice one is all he can muster. But, you know, he's 17 and it makes sense that he wouldn't be too bothered. Plus, he probably, you know, instantly foresees endless babysitting in his future. He'll probably have to make the baby's meals too. I mean, maybe he'll have to pre-chew them if the baby's as lazy as Denise. So, yeah, Dave and Denise are pregnant. This is a great thing to have up front within the first five minutes of the new series. Something to change the narrative focus and push the story forward. It's not too clear, as I said earlier, how far away we are from the wedding itself at this point. But I don't think it's, you know, beyond the realm of possibility that the baby was conceived on honeymoon in Tenerife. So that would just put us like, you know, a month or so after the date. And like when they had their brief ceasefire in the wedding episode, that's Denise and Anthony. You remember when they were getting on well and then Denise was crowing on back about her room and how she couldn't stand that she was giving it up. Denise... She can't really bask in the glow of newly announced motherhood for too long before digging into her younger brother. Leave all that, Nick. There's a new life forming in my womb. It's not even asked. (laughs) Barbara, though, is still completely besotted with the revelation. She asks Denise when it is. She says January, which, as we know, it's December, actually, when the baby's born. But I like that they pop that in there, meaning that this episode's meant to be in March, I guess. You know, maybe the headlines match up on that mirror, but uh, I don't think so. Barbara then asks Dave if he's pleased. He says he's delighted. Denise looks at him lovingly as he says it. And Jim, the work-shy layabout that he is, urges Dave, hypocritically, to get stuck in now and get all the overtime that he can. And Jim, he seems to be being kind to Denise here by saying well done, but he then follows it up with saying at least she can do something right, which, <laughs> which is great. And like Dead Dead Crispy, the next section as well has really crept into my vernacular. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Can't. <laughs> can you believe it? Yeah. <laughs> The loving way she says, yeah. I mean, Barbara's so ecstatic over the news, and her reaction never fails to sweep me up in the joy with her. She laughs to herself, shakes her head in disbelief, inhales and goes to exhale without even thinking near to these, but then wafts it away for fear of the baby. And Barbara doesn't really seem to realise that her blowing carcinogenic smoke on Denise and Denise just inhaling a cigarette are very closely aligned and not good at all, but the irony and the way that Denise says, ooh, lovely, as it blows in her hair, that is hilarious. And like The thoughtlessness, the ignorance, but still couched within a very mother and daughter type dynamic. Superb. <sighs> <laughs> oh no, no, I like it. Lovely. <laughs> and this got me thinking about secondhand smoke effects on the baby. I mean, not to be too morbid, but I'm just kind of interested in it. So, this is from the CDC, which is a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Because their bodies are developing, infants and young children are especially vulnerable to poisons in secondhand smoke. Both babies whose mothers smoke while pregnant and babies who are exposed to secondhand smoke after birth are more likely to die from sudden infant death syndrome than babies who are not exposed to cigarette smoke. Mothers who are exposed to secondhand smoke while pregnant are more likely to have lower birth weight babies, which makes babies weaker and increases the risk for many health problems. And after this, Barbara gets teary-eyed. <laughs> Oh, Mum. Oh, Dave, look at me, Mum. No. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Dave seems to be a bit choked up there too I mean Sue Johnston's acting here as usual is terrific her glances, her pauses do you know I've been waiting for this day all my life oh. I can't tell you how happy you've made me and that line there do you know I've been waiting for this day all my life that is so sweet and so believable as well like what a grandmother Barbara becomes and she's just such a loving person in general really and you know you totally believe that like you know when she would getting married to Jim or pregnant or whatever that she would be looking forward to her own granddaughter you know because that, that's what it's all about isn't it really Barb asks if Dave's parents know he says they don't on account of it being a secret and all but I mean were they really not going to come round and say it instantly? You know, it's hard to envision Denise holding on to that. Dave, though, probably could, but more out of gormlessness than excitement, perhaps. Barbara then puts it into perspective for Jim. Oh, Jim. Our first grandchild. I know, I can't bloody believe it. And after he says that, he, of course, looks straight back to the TV. Cora's still on from what I can gather from the theme. But seemingly his eyes are just magnetically drawn to the box. 
Barbara then gives another little gleeful noise and asks about how they discovered they were pregnant. Well, the period was late, right? And then I was really sick. But I thought, oh, you know, it was just hangover because the night before we'd had that locking at the feathers. But then the next day I was really sick again. So I went down Bootsy's, right, and got a pregnancy kit. For 10 quid, they are. Ooh. And um, anyway, the line came up in the square window. Oh, Denise, the square window. Yeah. <laughs> so I was shouting for Dave at the top of the stairs, but he was watching something on telly. What was you watching, Dave? Never mind the buzzcocks. And, um, and then he come up and I'm at it. He daddy, daddy, guess what? Like that to him, didn't I, Dave? Mm. And did he know what you meant? No. No, no. Well, then I said, you know, Dave, I'm pregnant, like that, and uh, mm. Penny dropped, didn't he? Yeah, straight away, yeah. And then the Penny dropped. Dave, who, like Jim, keeps returning to the TV, you know, you'd think he'd be looking at Barbara or Denise as they tell the story, but no. Never mind the Buzzcocks too. Buzzcocks, of course, is the comedy panel show themed on pop music that aired between 96 to 2015. And it was just recently announced, actually, to be returning with Daisy May Cooper and Noel Fielding as guests, which is going to be hosted by Greg Davis. Dave would have been watching the classic era, though. That was when Mark Lamar was presenting Bill Bailey and Phil Jupiter. And Daisy May Cooper as well. I mean, I don't know if you guys agree, but I'm putting this country up there. I think this country is a phenomenal programme. Like, Obviously, I think the royal family is better than this country, don't get me wrong, but this country is one of the best things I've seen in a long, long time. And there is a great podcast about this country as well, so definitely go check that out. I think it's called WTAF, a This Country Podcast. I think they've, like, they, they've done essentially what I want to do with the Royal Ramble. They've interviewed everyone involved with the show and done all the recaps and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, plug over. And interestingly, when Denise mentions a period, Jim scrunches his nose in displeasure and shoots a look of disdain. And Barbara looks at him as well, knowing he would, of course. And I love that Barbara, too, is gripping onto the square window as a great sigil of their pregnancy. She asks Dave if he was delighted. And of course, his words and tone don't quite match here, as is the Dave way. But you were delighted, weren't you, Dave? Yeah, big style. And we are seeing before our eyes here the slow disintegration of Dave, the snuffing out of his personality into a bit of an imbecile, a process that's catalyzed, no doubt, by Denise's pregnancy and the imminent arrival of baby David. Barbara inhales, stubs out a pretty much full cigarette into the legendary Domino's ashtray, and then listens to Denise. <laughs> right, you know, last night, right, I was watching Animal Hospital, and Dave had his head there on my belly, and he was just talking to the baby. Oh, mm-hmm. not bad. Animal Hospital, of course, is a British TV show which was hosted by disgraced Australian pervert Rolf Harris, and it ran on BBC One from 94 to 2004, and more recently starred Phil Dixon. Now, Jim, come on here. I mean, you know, very funny, but it's very sweet of Dave to do that. And it's kind of hard to imagine to a certain extent here, but from what we can see, Dave's pretty wrapped up in fatherhood already. Barbara then asks Dave what he wants, and he says that he wants a boy. She then asks Anthony, who is still making the bacon, mind you, to grab the phone to tell Nana. Lots of shots have put upon Anthony here too. And, you know, they seem to have doubled down on him as a dog's body. A bit like the my asses of Jim. I mean, this is the second series after all. So I'm sure they would have heard feedback of what people enjoy and maybe put that more in. Or, or maybe not. But that's just me kind of presupposing there. Anthony comes in, pulls up the antenna of the cordless phone. How quaint is that? And Barbara then tries to call Nana. Hiya. Hiya, ma'am. Ma'am. Our Denise and Dave have got something very special to tell you. Oh, OK then. Bye. Let me ring her back after Corrie. Damn, Nana is invested in Corrie. And I mean, you know, fair enough, Barbara hadn't stated up front what it was, but she hadn't really been given a chance either, yeesh. And Jim, you know, getting his barbs in there, calling her an old snatch and stuff like that. Denise then tells everyone that Dave is starting the process of making the box room into a nursery, but the moped, the moped's staying. Dave's making a start of making that box room into a nursery. Oh, what are you going to do with the moped? That was in it. Hey, that's going. That's going nowhere. Dave, you can't put a newborn baby in with a moped. Walk over on it. Anthony then comes in with the bacon butties and seems far happier about the news. Hey, it's great news that our kid. I can't wait. Aww. Well, give your Thanks. sister a kiss, shake Dave's hand. Where's your manners? Nice one, Dave. Cheers, Woodley. 
Where's his manners? I mean, he just made bacon butties for them. And in the script, it says that Dave says, cheers, Anthony. But in the actual show, he seems to mix up Buddy and Anthony and actually says, cheers, Budley, if you listen. Anthony also kisses Denise slightly awkwardly on the cheek, but it's sweet. And again, though, tranquility cannot hold. And Denise notices that Dave doesn't have his red sauce on his buddy. And I like how Denise spots that first, knowing his preference. Me? Where's the red sauce for Dave? No red sauce. Get the red sauce, you lazy sod. The irony there. Almost too rich to bear. And it's great to see that Anthony made himself a sandwich and has a crust in his mouth and it just sort of cuts to him like half nibbling. Couldn't Dave just pop back into the kitchen to grab a bloody bottle of ketchup? Well, clearly not, apparently. Ketchup, by the way, big fan of ketchup, personally. The unmodified term ketchup now typically refers to tomato ketchup, although original recipes used egg whites, mushrooms, oysters, grapes, mussels or walnuts, among other ingredients. The market leader for ketchup in the US with 60% market share is Heinz tomato ketchup, and it's the same over here, but that's 82% in the UK. And it turns out that ketchup's origins, though, are anything but American. Ketchup, this is very highly disputed. I went down a big rabbit hole on the origins of the word ketchup, but apparently ketchup comes from the Chinese word ketsiap, which is a name of a sauce derived from fermented fish. And it is believed that traders brought fish sauce from Vietnam to southeastern China. The British likely encountered ketchup in southeast Asia, returned home and tried to replicate the fermented dark sauce. This probably happened in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, as evidenced by a recipe published in 1732 for ketchup in paste by Richard Bradley, which referred to Benkelin in the East Indies as its origin. Now, obviously, they don't call it ketchup in this show. They call it red sauce. And red sauce is a term used in Welsh English, Scottish English, Ulster English, and some parts of England, such as the Black Country and in South London. In Canadian and American English, red sauce refers to various tomato-based sauces like marinara, which is commonly paired with pasta dishes, whereas in the UK, it's just a synonym for ketchup. Now, did you notice that Dave's voice broke there when he realised there's no ketchup? No red sauce! You know, there's more emotion in there declaring there's no red sauce than when he speaks about being excited for the baby. We see Anthony in the kitchen splurting out some red sauce on the bread as Jim declares that he doesn't know where he gets it from as the sauce is squoes. To quote Carl Pilkington, great word, squoes. On the TV, Cora is still playing. We can hear Fred, Elliot and Ashley on the box as Barb reminds Denise that she's eating for two. Denise says she really hopes it's a girl. She wants to get her ears pierced for the christening. Jim says she might as well get a tattooed for it as well. Anthony brings back the sandwich, plops it on Dave's lap, who says thanks and gives an appreciative whistle. And though the baby isn't even the size of an orange yet, Denise is already considering options on how to palm it off. Hey, Anthony, we've got you down as the main baby, sir. You kiss my ass. <laughs> like father, like son there with the ass comment. And Barbara then realises that they should be celebrating. Not with bacon sandwiches, but with alcohol, of course. Anyway, what am I thinking about? We should be celebrating. Anthony, nip down the offing and get us some pomaine. And I'm not going to go into detail with pomaine, as we've actually already covered it on the show on the Jim's birthday episode. But champagne? Well, champagne is a sparkling wine produced in the Champagne wine region of France under the rules of appellation that demands specific vineyard practices, sourcing of grapes exclusively from designated places within it, specific grape pressing methods, and secondary fermentation of the wine in the bottle to cause carbonation. Champagne can only be classed as champagne if it's made in Champagne, France. Anything else is classed as sparkling wine. Jim learns, though, that champagne is around 25 quid, so he settles for a fiver on some pomaine. Ant informs Denise that she can't drink now as she has the baby, but she, of course, has different ideas about that. You know what, Denise? You're not supposed to have any. Yeah, I am. I mean, I can't get tanked up like most nights, but... Oh, I can have a good old couple, can't I, man? Oh, yeah, I did with you two. I mean, come on, Denise isn't thinking of anyone else but numero uno, naturally. And, you know, not to get all didactic here, I mean, just a little thing here on the concept of drinking alcohol whilst pregnant. Because, again, I was just interested. So this is from the NHS. The chief medical officers for the UK recommend that if you're pregnant or planning to become pregnant, the safest approach is not to drink alcohol at all to keep risks to your baby to a minimum. Drinking in pregnancy can lead to long-term harm to the baby, with the more you drink, the greater the risk. A baby's liver is one of the last organs to develop and does not mature until the later stages of pregnancy. And drinking alcohol, especially in the first three months of pregnancy, increases the risk of miscarriage, premature birth, and your baby having a low birth weight. Barbara confirming that she drank with you two as well. I mean... I guess that's a kind of, you know, there's just a kind of wink-wink joke there, really. Like, has that had any impact? It's probably Jim's parenting that's kind of ruined these kids more than anything. But, you know, it is funny that she says that. And this comes up again. Uh, This comes up in the next episode where Denise talks about drinking and pregnancy. So, clearly something that plays on her mind. 
Denise then gets on to names. And, you know, names are always a fun thing to think about, aren't they, with babies? Everything I like, he doesn't like. If it's a girl, I really want Whitney. Oh, Whitney. That's gorgeous. Whitney. What if it's a boy? Well, I really want Keanu. But Dave wants Dave. Ooh. But Dave wants Dave. What do you think, Jim? Hey, what about... Well, if it's a boy, Dave wants to call it Dave. Well, you're on it here, Dave. What do you want another one for? Come on, son, get a bloody grip of yourself. See? Well, it's like handing it down, isn't it? I mean, my dad was Dave. And his dad... I don't think his dad was as well. And his dad. Love that pause there. And his dad. You know, he's saying it with a half-eaten bacon butty in his hand. And sweet Barbara, you know, she's all about these odd parallels. I mean, you'll remember in the pilot there was talk of ginger balls and Chris Evans and suddenly ideas of a tangerine emerged. Well, talk of baby bearing leads to the revelation that Lorraine, Leggins Lorraine, who we've heard of prior, um, she's been sterilised. I mean, how did this info get out? I guess it's a small neighbourhood, everyone's chatting in the precinct, but that's real personal. Perhaps she said it herself. You know and... Lorraine across the road? Leggings, Lorraine. Yeah, she's been sterilised. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, four's enough for any single mother. But I love that rumination as well. Four is enough for any single mother. There's a lot of kind of doleful misery around the royals that they've harked towards, like, old Frank in the bus shelter. But really, it just kind of gilds the edges, as it were, of the storyline, rather than becoming the, you know, the beating heart of it being like a real kitchen sink, our friends in the north type drama. Jim imagines that it's like a clown's pocket down there. Dave laughs. Barbara scolds Jim slightly. And then Denise reveals her latest weapon. Dave. Hmm? The baby wants some milk. Uh. Yeah, the baby wants some milk. I mean, Denise, as we've seen and we've discussed, likes to talk for other people. You know, getting Barbara to ask Anthony to make her bacon dead, dead, crispy, etc. But now she has someone within her. She has a person to speak through 24-7, the baby. And, you know, Dave doesn't protest. He gets up immediately into the kitchen to fetch some milk. Jim, though, clearly and obviously has no time for it. Look at the big soft sod. Dad, I'm pregnant. I've got to take it easy now. What do you mean now? Well, she's right. She's got to drink a lot of milk. It's good for the baby's teeth. Good for the baby's teeth. Well, I guess technically, I mean, they don't really have teeth for a while. More the bones, but, you know, it is good for her. And then there's about ten seconds of silence as mother and daughter and, you know, baby, I suppose, sit beside each other watching TV. Dave then returns, treads in. Jim shakes his head at him. He calls Denise mummy as he passes her the milk and returns to the butty, which is really sweet. And Barbara then asks Denise if she's considered breastfeeding, which goes into a funny sequence in which Jim insults Barb's breasts. He's barbing the breasts, as it were, saying the springs have gone, they look like Spaniel's ears. And to get himself out of the hole when she threatens that he won't see them again, he offers up a silly little rhyme saying that he won't put the mockers on his wife's shriveled knockers. Something she responds to by kicking him, which is good to see. But... You know, there have been a few references to Barb and Jim's sex life. I'm pretty sure one of the specials ends with Jim not performing in the bedroom. One of the new specials post-Queen of Sheba, although I have to rewatch those. Something in the back of my head suggesting that. But, you know, at the end of episode two, I believe it is, um, you know, Barb asks Jim if he wants an early night. And he says, is there anything on the TV? And now here as well. And I guess Beast My Ass earlier is, is another allusion to that. And I'm not saying shock horror, people have sex or anything like that. But but I like that, you know, sometimes these sort of things aren't really alluded to or aren't really there as decoration amongst the kind of, you know, the whole um, mechanics of the relationship. It reminds me a little bit of Margin Homer. Like, I've watched a lot of early Simpsons recently. They have a lot of sex in the show. And it's like reference just straight on, which I really, really like. So, yeah, um, this happens... And now Denise, like, Denise, I love you, you know, but I'm going to be harsh on you as well. And it's hilarious how the writers really use the pregnancy to take her laziness to, to whole new heights, you know, her unlikable qualities to a brand new level. So here she is speaking about breastfeeding. No, I'm not going to breastfeed. I've been thinking about it, right? And if the baby wants feeding in the night with my breasts, it'll mean me having to wake up. Mm. Well, if it's like bottle fed and everything, Dave can do it. You know, when you're not there. It's a gotta keep me independence, that's the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. You, 
You must keep your independence. Keep her independence? What independence? The independence that meant she couldn't tell her own brother how she wanted her bacon done. The independence that meant she has to get Dave to ferry milk for her when it's literally a yard away. I mean, the irony is brilliant and just too much. And I have been going on at Denise here, and, you know, I will continue to throughout this series, but it is worth considering perhaps how much of her father's daughter she is, whilst Anthony is very much after Barbara. You know, perhaps Jim has conjured this himself to a certain extent by being so lazy. You know, of course his children, or at least one of them, is going to take heed from that. And the rulers of the household are now, in effect, reaping what they have sown. And, you know, consider the fact that Denise automatically imagines Barbara in her own imaginings too, and, and how she'll be there to help along Dave, just... That's just an expectation for her. That's just something she thinks is going to happen. You know, in many ways, Denise is still in the womb herself, so to speak. The, the raw household acting as that. The baby we learn is the size of a little nut currently, which makes Denise's demands in this episode even more inexplicable. Dave then says he's getting stuck in with the nappies. Jim, we learn, obviously never did. And I must say... You know, I'm not a father yet, touch wood, I'm touching my uh, the wooden floor of my bedroom. Um, you know, but I must say, I really hate men that refuse to get involved with that sort of stuff. So cringe, I think, you know. I mean, again, not a father, can't really empathise at all, but still, the kind of gym way of thinking, you know, is antiquated. And it is being held up for laughs here as well, definitely. Dave is kind of a, you don't want to say modern man, because you wish every man would behave that way. But, you know, good for Dave, he's clearly not shying away from any of his duties. You know, we're seeing that he's going to be hands-on, we'll see that he's hands-on in series three, where he's effectively, in many ways, a single parent. Denise then shares some news of what Dave is also planning. Hey, do you know what Dave's getting? You know one of those things that you put there and then you put the baby in it? Oh. Hey, and you carry it around. Hey, <laughs> 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 <Are you> Dave! <laughs> That's not definite yet, Denise. Jim is cruel in this one. It doesn't seem to have any sympathy, really, with the plight of parenthood in general. And, you know, considering he'll be a granddad for the first time as well, you may imagine that he'd be swept up in the whimsy of it all, but no. For all his ire, though, like, you know, Jim is honest to a fault, perhaps. And when he starts up here, you know, it's, it's kind of fair enough, I guess. I'm not going to be able to have a nanny straight away, you know. Oh, what bloody nanny? Well, I can't be looking after it full time. I've got to think about my independence, Dad. What bloody independence? Sitting on your ass all day watching Richard and Judy. Well, I think she's right. Why don't you leave the baby in and just come and visit the bugger once a week? <laughs> a nanny? Really? I mean, there's an unnecessary expense. Jim rightly says that they may as well leave it here and visit it once a week, to which Denise laughs a, a nice mirthful laugh. And, you know, and perhaps in that moment, for a moment, sees the silliness of her own plans, but probably not. Richard and Judy is referenced, and Richard and Judy, of course, is the name informally given to Richard Maidley and Judy Finnegan, who are both TV presenters and columnists. They presented the daytime television programme this morning from 1988 until 2001, and then hosted the daily chat show Richard and Judy from 2001 until 2009. And that's the one I remember. That used to be on Channel 4. I want to say it was like at 5 to 6 tea time. They had that thing where they had to guess images from behind them and give people a grand for each one that was apparently maybe rigged or something. But that was quite a good magazine type show to be honest with you they had a lot of interesting guests they had the Richard and Judy book club as well which of course was just a direct cribbing from Oprah but you know I was like 14 15 at the time and you know I'm really into literature and okay they weren't reading book books not that I'm sneering down on my nose I'm like I really enjoyed a lot of the stuff they did but it was just kind of nice to see people discussing books on primetime tv I hadn't really seen that before and I like Richard Maley like you know I'm not going to make the trite point that he is partridge reincarnated because duh but um, his enthusiasm, you know, his vocabulary and his willingness to be cringe, got a lot of time for that. Anthony then comes back from the shop and rather than pomaine, he has some Asti. Now, Asti is a sparkling white Italian wine that is produced throughout southeastern Piedmont, but he's particularly focused around the towns of Asti and Alba. Since 1993, the wine has been classified as a DOCG and as of 2004 was Italy's largest producing appellation. Jim asks for his change after the initial excitement of some Asti being in the building. Ant tells everyone that he saw duckers down the offy and he let him know, but Denise obviously isn't happy. It's mine and Dave's baby. Man, will you tell Anthony to stop telling everyone? Stop telling everyone, Anthony. I only told duckers. Oh, jeez. So duckers knows about it before my own nana. Your own bloody nana's more bloody interested in bloody coronation bloody shit than the baby. Jim, how many bloodies is that? That's four. Check four bloodies, Bob. And Jim is correct, actually. 
Nana didn't care. You know, admittedly, she didn't know, but still. And God, Denise, so Ducker's nose before Nana. What ramifications does that actually have on anything? And she's just always chasing after some non-existent conflict. It's very petty. Barbara's holding the Asti in hand. There's a great close-up of her uncorking it, twisting the wires. Denise smiles at her dad, who builds the hype before it gets popped. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> nice one, Babo. Must be fresh, that. <laughs> nice to see Denise and Dave kiss each other on the cheek. There's been a lot of physical contact between these two, which uh, sets the stage and just builds this kind of loving atmosphere. I appreciate that. The Asti is poured into a variety of cups, but the couple get proper glasses. You know, Denise says she's drinking for two now and asks for more, which obviously is making it even worse for the currently nut-sized baby David. Jim asks for a bit more too and starts a little speech. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be able to say that uh, we know that Dave isn't firing blanks. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm no Jaffa. Now, Dave seems to take offence to the firing blanks comment from Jim, and Anthony uses Pinky to demonstrate said infertility. But, you know, it's all a bit rich, really, because he was laughing at Jim's comments earlier. But Anthony, I will say, does go a bit too far here, especially when they've just announced a pregnancy. Hey, hey it might not even be Dave's. <laughs> Anthony, why do you have to spoil everything? Of course it's Dave's. Of course it's Dave's. Of course it's mine. Denise saying to Anthony, why does he always have to ruin everything, is a little much, but classic sibling. It was a little far, though, but to be fair, Anthony does get insulted left, right and centre, though. So, you know, he's allowed an uppercut or two every now and then, I think. They cheers to Keanu or Whitney. I mean, of course, both big names at this time in their career. And chinks with Dave, and, you know, it seems mended their little strife. He necks it, Anthony, says, can I have another? And it's an excellent single shot of him gritting his teeth and asking for it, which is artful. And Whitney Houston, by the way, I mean, Whitney Houston, giant star. Obviously, around this time, her album My Love Is Your Love, that was her fourth studio album, came out. That came out in November 98. And uh, it was her first album in eight years, although she had participated in soundtracks during that time. And I remember that song, My Love Is Your Love, being on the radio all the time in that era. And Keanu, I mean, what can you say about Keanu Reeves? Like, all the way from Bill and Ted to Matrix to uh, your Point Break, Constantine. I don't even like Constantine. I don't know why I'm thinking of that one. It just came to the top of my head. But yeah, an- another great actor. How can you not love that guy? And Jim, you know, he just can't let it slide, can he? We mentioned the unfortunate use of gay boy and gay slurs in the wedding episode. And, you know, they're prevalent here again. He calls Anthony a little bummer as well and a gay boy and all that. And that he's not going to give any grandkids. And, you know, this is his own son, mind. One who just went to the shop for them. And one who seems a bit aggrieved at these comments. I'm absolutely made up with you love being pregnant. Because, you know, if it was left to old gay boy over there... We'd never have any grandkids. Oh. <laughs> Jim, it's a celebration. Oh, he's a little old bummer. Barbara lights up. We get another shot of the bursting ashtray as it goes onto her lap. She then asks Dave who's going to be in the hospital. He says, yeah. Barbara says she'll be there too. Cheryl as well, which reminds Denise that she hasn't even told Cheryl yet. Reluctantly, Anthony has to leave again in a huff. Jim wonders where he gets it from, and um, I'm sure we're all wondering too. Denise, it seems, though, has got it all worked out. Mm. Can I show to be godmother? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, she'd be great, show. Yeah. And if I ask her to be godmother, she'll never mind when I ask her to babysit. No. Why don't you just get the baby adopted? Bloody hell, there's nothing like a mother's love, is there? And Jim, again, for his miserly nature, is correct again. There is nothing like a mother's love, and and mother's love is going to be nothing like Denise's. You know, think about it. Has she spoken about, you know, what's its personality going to be? How she can't wait to meet it, hold it, cuddle it, kiss it, put it to bed? You know, it's been nannies and the avoidance of breastfeeding and babysitting, and, you know, it's grim, really. It's funny for sure in its exaggerated nature, but the reality of the mother that she'll be, something we're already seeing, you know, it's already demonstrating that just after she's announced that she's with child. It's, uh, It's very telling. Barbara then asks Denise if Anthony will be asked to be godfather, and she immediately, dismissively, says no. And besides, Dave, like Denise, is going to get something out of asking someone to be the godparent to their child. It's not about if they're suited for it and will they fit. It's more about how it can benefit them. Anyway, Dave wants Gary. Hmm, do you, Dave? Well, his mum died recently, Barbara, you know. Oh. 
And I owe him 200 quid, you know, so it should hold him off for a bit, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 200 pound debt and a parent passing. You know, I guess a godchild can fill that gap for a bit. And, you know, always great that we get a reference to Gary as well from the butchers. Him that stinks of mints. Denise then wonders about Anthony. He'll be a while yet, won't he? He'll still be trying to prize her bloody head up the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move this anyway before she spots it. Oh. Harsh from Jim there. You know, perhaps all these Cheryl gags are him projecting his own weight insecurities, but I've got a feeling that Jim doesn't really care about what he looks like at all. And Denise, again, just looking to pick a fight. Myva that Anthony may have said something, and, well... Again, as I said at the start of this episode, we don't go anywhere, you know, in these 30 minutes. So there's no cut even to the kitchen as these people enter. I love that we can just hear Mary and Cheryl singing. I love that we get Cheryl and Mary at the end as well. Great characters. They swarm in. Hugs are exchanged. And then a few seconds later, Joe comes in, hands in pockets. Cheryl then comments on the timing, stating that they were only watching the wedding video again last night. Oh, that video. I bet Jim's speech is on there. What, what a dream watch that video would be. Jim asks Joe what he thinks. He says, oh, I, of course, which Jim mouths in mockery off to the side. Denise then has some news. Cheryl, guess I want to be godmother. Who? You. Oh, Jesus. Oh. That's just because you babysit all the bloody time. Oh, Jim, take the notice of him, love. Oh, no, I'd love to look after it all the time. Aww, Jim, you show Jim again is, I know I keep saying this, he's correct, but I mean, does he really just have to mouth off uninhibited? He's worse than wedding day Norma at times. I love the staging of this shot too, with Mary behind, and Mary, who is rocking a new hairdo as well. She's just so overjoyed. That sweet Jesus, she says, came from the soul. Oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> and Cheryl, of course, is down for the cause. And then, following that, the nothingness of horoscopes is explored. If it's early January, it'll be Capricorn. But if it's later January, then it'll be Aquarius. Oh. Well, I'm going to try and hold on if I can till late January, because yeah. Dave's Aquarius. Ooh, are you an Aquarius, Dave? Yeah, I am, yeah. Joe's Aquarius. Oh, are you an Aquarius, Joe? Yeah. And you know what they say, your horoscope won't replace your personality. Dave and Joe clearly have no interest in this. But let's consider Aquarius for a second. This is from Cosmopolitan magazine that I've just found online. Does this sound like it encapsulates both the men? So apparently Aquariuses are analytical, original, humanitarian, independent, easygoing. I mean... None of them scream Dave or Joe to me, to be honest with you. It looks like horoscopes might be of interest to Mary as well, as when Cheryl is talking and working out where the dates lie, you can see Mary behind her mouthing along. And I guess it makes some sense, you know, Mary's very spiritual to a certain extent, so perhaps it would extend into the realm of constellations. Jim asks Joe if he wants to go to the bar as Denise is organising a coach trip. He doesn't respond to that, but he does then offer up something a bit different. A little baby, eh? A little baby. Yeah. Full of surprises, Joe, Silver Tongue Joe. You know, he seems swept up in it to a certain extent, making a pronouncement like that. Anthony looks at him oddly, as it does kind of come out of nowhere, you know, especially from Joe. And, and it's interesting that Jim says nothing, doesn't do an OI of his own, really. He just kind of agrees, not mockingly, just concurring. Because I think mean, this is a huge thing, really. And sometimes you don't have to just joke on it, you know. And Cheryl, as always, interestingly, has food on her mind. So made up. Hey, Denise, you can eat for two now. Yeah. yeah. Eating for two, of course. And more ire is then poured upon Dave's enlightened outlook. Hey, Dave's got to come with me to antenatal classes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going there for, soft lad? I like how you can hear Anthony laughing off camera. And, you know, Jim doesn't see any difficulty with raising kids. Of course he doesn't. Well, what's it a bloody lane? You feed the bugger when it's hungry, change it snappy when it's crapped itself. That's all there is to it. Oh, and what do you know? You never came near these two when they were little. Barbara then reflects on Jim as a parent of young kids, and Mary describes Joe and Cheryl. Before we get to that, though, it's intriguing to think about the age differences between Ant and Denise. 
it's not like they had twins and you know Jim was apparently all six and sevens trying to help but he had Denise to practice until the age of six and seven and you know could have put what he learned into helping Barbara but you know I imagine the fact that to Jim the fact that he worked that exempt him from any co-parenting. I always remember when Cheryl was born he was terrified of holding her. She was such a delicate little thing. She was only six pounds. Who <laughs> was Cheryl? Yes. Barbara knows how to stomp that out from Jim straight away, and it's rude of him to speak up so loud. Cheryl, though, seems to be on the right path, however. How's your diet going, Cheryl? Oh, um, I lost half a stone. Oh, yeah. Oh, Cheryl. Oh, wonderful. Oh, well done. That's loads, that, Cheryl. No, I don't mean half a stone. I mean half a pound. Oh. Oh, well. Good, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, it's going in the right direction. Yeah. Yes. Moving in the right direction, at least. Barbara then says it'll be Cheryl's turn next, and from a new angle we can see Joe behind her, furrowing his brow in disagreement. Mary is hopeful, but also a realist, putting the hurdles ahead of her daughter into a neat little list. All she needs to do now is find a boyfriend, get married, and then conceive. <laughs> She's got no chance. <laughs> It's so good that the sentence begins with all she has to do, and then what she has to do is a giant undertaking. One made even more difficult by the fact that it's old Cheryl from next door undertaking the gauntlet. Great too that Mary, ever the good Catholic, mentions getting married before conceiving, obviously. And, you know, he has these off-colour remarks, but at least Barbara is there to tamp down Jim. Joe doesn't seem to get any of that from Mary, though. And his comment of she's got no chance is brutal. Cheryl seems to hear it too as she looks down. I mean, of course she heard it, just behind her, above her even. And it's kind of depressing that within a minute of her being in the lounge, both Jim and Joe, you know, kind of a father and a father figure in her life, have flung nasty comments her way. Mary then brings up Lorraine and her leggings being sterilised. You know, great minds think alike. Jim mentions they'll be in the pub when Denise gives birth. Denise doesn't want Dave there, but Jim points out that he's already done his little bit, so... Mary and Barb then reflect on what it was like when they gave birth. Oh, they have them in and out of hospitals now, Barbara. Yeah. Not like it was with us. We were in a week. Yeah. I remember when I came home with our Denise, there wasn't a thing done in the house. <laughs> Jim hadn't even washed a dish while I'd been in. I was leaving them to soak. <laughs> Barbara has to laugh, <laughs> you know, by now, doesn't she? Uh, leaving them to soak. Classic. Mary then leaves, stating that the bill is on in a bit. Surprised that's her bag. You know, I do like how often Mary leaves and states that something is on the TV, like Ruth Rendell, etc. And the bill, the bill is, of course, a British police procedural television show, first broadcast on ITV in August 83, and it was broadcast until the 31st of August 2010. The programme originated from a one-off drama, Wooden Top, which was also broadcast in August 1983. The programme focused on the lives and works of one shift of police officers rather than on any particular aspect of police work. The bill was the longest-running police procedural television series in the UK and among the longest-running of any British TV shows at the time of its cancellation. The term obviously originates from Old Bill, which is a slang term for the police. And I will say as well, the bill, like, it's not something that I really watch much myself. One of the greatest theme songs ever. Like, seriously, it has no right to be as funky and as proggy as it is. It feels like a Frank Zappa, like, wig out. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the bill, the bill. But go check out the bill soundtrack right now. Like, the bass, just that stabs of the synths. Like, really classic. Love it. So Mary's leaving, but Cheryl is coming back later. Are you staying, Cheryl? No, no, I'll offer me tea and then I'll come back later. Will you yeah. still be here? Yeah. Mm. See you later. Oh, you don't want to miss your tea, love you. You'd be bloody wasting away. Jim, stop. It's, it's not like anyone intervenes. You know, her parents maybe would have, but of course they maybe wouldn't have either, you know. And we cut to Denise, Barb and Dave together, cringing slightly at that. I mean, Dave is holding his laughter, but Barb sort of rears up in her seat. They all leave, but Cheryl is coming back later. Nana is going to ring later after Corrie, too. I mean, the sense of this world really existing and going on without us is so magnificently realised. Barbara moves across. Jim makes sure they're gone and grabs back the Asti, fills it plentifully for himself and no one else. 
Barbara looks at his field glass a little surprised. And, you know, Jim's insulted Cheryl already a few times now, so why not get to her father? But it's Anthony with the zinger. Tell you what, though, Joe was made up about the baby, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he was, yeah. Aye. Little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy to impersonate, but yeah, what was that comment about? And hilarious to Anthony, really kind of cuts through. Jim mentions the fact that they're going to do a South Bank show on Joe. The South Bank show is, of course, a British TV arts magazine show, originally produced by London Weekend Television and broadcast on ITV between 1978 and 2010. A new version began on Sky Arts from 2012. Of course, it's conceived, written and presented by Melvin Bragg, who I'm a giant fan of. I mean, I love In Our Time especially. And I have seen some of the South Bank show, like they had a little bit of it on Now TV On Demand and stuff like that. And, you know, it is very thorough. And Melvin Bragg is a great interviewer. But I think even he <laughs> would struggle with Joe. Jim then grabs his newspaper and sets off. I'm off to the car, see, to try for a little baby of me own. Jim. Dad. Hey, be careful of them stairs, Grandad. Hey, Bloody hell, yeah. Grandad. <laughs> and yeah, Jim. Jim's going to be a Grandad. And with Jim, we leave the living room for the first time the whole episode, and he trudges upstairs, leaving us with a classic line. <laughs> Key out of my ass. All right, guys, and there you have it. So, as always, if you enjoy the show and you'd like to give back to the show in any way, there are many ways you can do that. You can leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us at the Raw Ramble Pod on Twitter. Please email me, the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com if you've got any correspondences or indeed you want to come on the quiz show. The Patreon is there too if you've really enjoyed today's episode and you want to listen to the next one, which is the current longest Raw Ramble episode at the time we're recording this. It's being Sunday afternoon, it's about 90 minutes or so. If you want to gain access to that, you can go on the Patreon, download it to your phone, listen on your iPod, whatever you want to do. Uh, how else can you help? Tell friends, go to YouTube, post it on Facebook. You know, we, we're out here, basically. And uh, really enjoying doing this. Really appreciate all you guys listening. It's such a blast, really, to go through this show. I mean, you know, what a masterpiece. I know I keep saying it, but I'm doing a podcast about it, so it kind of helps that I like it, doesn't it? Anyway, this has been Tom. I'll speak to you in about a month or so. And uh, yeah, until then, keep watching the show. Take it easy. <laughs>